Yeah, I might take me a couple of days, depending on the format, but, um, all this stuff always takes a little bit of I have to, uh, everybody watch uh, Dave's talk. <laughs> you have to juice the steel power. Right. Okay, you can pick different levels. Let's do it. 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 Let's do it.
you know, request to your database and do some like stuff to figure out who this user is and come back and then decide how to handle it because you would end up missing a data event. Um, and so that led to everybody having to write these uh, buffering streams implementations that would like, when you press pause, they would act, when you call pause, they would actually pause and would buffer things up in, in memory. Uh, it turns out this is actually really easy to get wrong. Um, and if you look at the history of computing, I guess in, in general, like, hey, I've got a whole bunch of data for you. You're not ready for it yet? Okay, I uh, will like, figure out how to do the right thing. It sounds really straightforward. Uh, when we're talking to people about it, but then when you sit down and actually do it, what you find is there's all these edge cases that are just kind of gnarly to deal with. Um, and so it led to some very unclear semantics about like, you know, when certain streams would, would automatically pause and would buffer up to a certain amount, other streams would just give you data even if you said you didn't want it um, and expect it to be your problem. And also there was no uh, extensible base classes, so all the user land streams were um, kind of a mess and would just have you know, completely different ways of, of doing things. And so it was more like, like this, where you have kind of this gnarly mess of stuff. Um, in particular, if you had one readable stream that you piped to multiple writers, a really terrible thing could happen, which um, ended up being a, a pretty gnarly bug in, uh, in Manta. And if I hadn't just fixed it in Node Core, um, Mark Cabbage actually pinged me and was like, hey, we're having this like crazy problem. We can't figure out why like we're running out of memory. I was like, oh, hey, I just fixed that bug. Um, okay, i like write a little thing for you. It took me like a half an hour because it was actually pretty straightforward, but it's like you have to know all this crap and all of these like semantics and edge cases, which are really, really problematic. Um, and basically what happened is if you uh, just back up a step. When you when you pipe to two different readers, um, you would write, uh, or sorry, pipe a reader to two different writers. You would write to those two different places, and let's say one of them gives you a false uh, response, indicating don't write any more data to me. Well, the other one might emit a drain event, which would trigger you to start flowing data again. And so if the slow one keeps getting stuff written to it, and the fast one keeps emitting drain events, then you, you end up filling up your, your memory with all this data. And you know what you really want to do is keep track of like how many things am I piping to, and how many of them have told me that I need to wait for a drain event, and, and just know that you have to handle this. Uh, so fixing the problems ideally, unfortunately, it was not actually an option at the time, because uh, uh, a lot of programs were built based on these certain semantics and sort of intentionally or not had come to rely on them. And it turns out backwards compatibility, if you're a platform, is one of the most important things. You know, we had people actually building like, you know, this, these weird kind of edge cases are all tied into the guts of how their programs work. So we took uh, between 0 0.8 and 0 0.10 of Node, we took quite a bit of time and uh, dug into this. It took, you know, as is often the case in software, it took about six months longer than I thought it would. Um, but in the end, <laughs> we, uh, you know, with a lot of work from a lot of different people, we kind of tracked this, this all down and we wrote Streams 2. So the Streams 2 API uh, changes things somewhat from a push model to a pull model on the readable side. So we have, um, we have this readable event which emits to let you know, it's really easy to walk in front of that thing, uh, which emits to let you know that there is data you can pull out. Uh, and then there's a read method which <laughs> takes all that data out of the stream. Um, Multi-piping works. We added extensible base classes so you could create your own writer or reader and it would do everything exactly correctly. Um, and there's even a compatibility layer which we added so that if you add a data event, it switches into old mode and just starts throwing data at you. There were some problems. Um, first of all, it was just a massive refactor. Um, you know, the more lines of, ch of code you change in any kind of platform, the more stuff you're going to change without realizing it, the more user land programs are going to break as a result. Um, no matter how hard you try to make that not happen. Uh, there was also a couple of cases where there were uh, performance issues which required us to keep some like oddball even pre-Stream0 kludges that were kind of living in the HTTP.js guts. 
Um, there was no way to passively listen to a stream. So if I have a reader and I have a writer and I want to like draw a progress bar on the screen or something, right? Like I don't want to do anything with that data. I just want to see it, see when it passes through. Um, there was no way to do that without switching your stream into old mode. And old mode, the compatibility mode was a one-way switch. So what would actually happen is the pipe method would get changed to some other pipe method, which is not the pipe <laughs> method that you had in the beginning. I told you, the metaphors are bad. They're bad. <laughs> They're saying that. Um, so recently, we've, uh, we've done, with actually very little fanfare, uh, what's what we've been t calling uh, Streams 3. And uh, basically, when you take the API of Streams 2 and the API of Streams 3, or the API of Streams 2 and the API of Streams 1, you get Streams 3. Um, this, is, this is, by the way, the character's name. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's the <laughs> so now instead of instead of the uh, it's it's literally like the overlap of those two APIs. So instead of having a flowing and a pause, or it's, I'm sorry, instead of having an old and a new mode, we have a flowing mode and a pause mode. So you can actually add a data listener, and that'll start data coming through, and then you can call the pause method, and that will pause it. And now some other user of this stream, you can hand that stream object off to someone else. They can call read, they can listen for readable events, they can do everything that they could do with streams too. Um, also this enabled us to, uh, in the process of going through this, we were able to focus on some of the um, performance regressions that had happened in streams too. Um, and even, there's an open pull request right now uh, but we'll probably get that landed soon, that allows us to remove some of these kludges from the HTTP implementation, which is really nice. So, uh, you know, if you look at the socket that's that the HTTP server is interacting with, it's just a normal TCP socket. It's not like this kind of jerry-rigged, like, different thing. Um, the other thing that was kind of a, a compelling motivator for landing the Streams 3 API patch was that a lot of people, when I explained to them how this would work, they said, hey, isn't that how it happens already? Like, did, oh, that's stupid that it doesn't already do that. And um, so yeah, it, it works how people apparently thought Streams 2 worked, which is nice. And uh, with the data events now, you can you can actually have that passive listener type of thing. Oh, thanks. Uh, other just, you know, minor thing that got added, uh, a pretty big deal, was that we added a cork and uncork method to the writable API. Uh, so with that, if your stream implements write v, which is like a um, you know an interface to the write v syscall, if you're that makes sense for that particular type of stream, you can call cork, do uh, write 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 write, and then uncork, and it'll take all those writes and send them as one uh, one syscall. So for uh, HTTP chunk decoding, that is really awesome because you know we do all these stupid things where we have like a tiny, like a two byte thing saying how big of a chunk it is, and then the chunk itself, and then the end of it, and like, you end up with all these tiny little things. If you're sending each one as a separate write over TCP, that's like a TCP round trip for what, for two bytes, it's stupid. So, you take the chunk and you take the little header that says how big it is, and you have to kind of concatenate them. Um, you end up with encoding issues, and. If that requires a full copy, then it only makes sense if it's like above a certain size and you end up with like these magic numbers littered throughout the code. It's a big, big mess. So using write v is absolutely the right way to go here. Um, so the problems with stream three, unfortunately, I don't know what they are yet. Uh, we will find out when I when I drop 0 0.12 on all you guys and uh, you, you have to suffer with them. Um, but yeah, 0 0.12 should be a really nice node version. Um, compared with uh, 0 0.10 or 0 0.8. And basically that's where we're gonna find the issues prior to 1.0 because the, the plan uh, thus far is just to have 0 0.12 be sort of like the, the preview release of 1.0. Um, we're gonna give it a few months, uh, do some performance and uh, stability fixes and mostly not change the API throughout that entire uh, cycle before 1.0. So beyond the obvious, like, why is this, and you know, obviously the fact that I work here, like, why am I talking about this here at this meetup? Um, I think the, an important takeaway of this is that systems are, when you consider the entire system, you're 
you're spending a lot of time actually looking at the application. And applications are built on top of platforms and they're assembled out of these libraries that are using um, that are using API patterns in order to be interoperable with one another. And a lot of the performance and usability um, problems that we've encountered in Node actually come out of these core API patterns. And I, I think that it's um, it's very applicable to you know other sorts of systems as well, where you have APIs and patterns that are used throughout the system. If there's problems in that, then that can be a, a good place to kind of focus your uh, your attention and, and optimizations, because it's going to yield big benefits throughout the entire stack. And it's often difficult to see the forest for the trees, so it's good to kind of uh, you know work at a high level and a low level at the same time, which I think is a big aspect of doing systems analysis and systems programming in general. So that's it. Um, Thanks, Gene. Have any questions? So thanks. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious. Uh, streams. What are the, what's the implementation detail there? Is it is it like arrays? Uh, is it like linked lists or like did you have to manipulate a lot of those internal data structures to like make this change? Or so uh, the the implementation detail for readable streams in streams two is that it's um, there is a, an array of chunks, and every time that data becomes available in the implementation, it calls a push method, which pushes that data onto the like internal buffer. And every time you call read, it pulls data out of that internal buffer. Um, the implementation detail between streams two and streams three, we changed the way that pipe works so that it actually works based on a, re a data method, or sorry, a, a data event. And um, every time you call read, it emits a data event. So that enables us to do passive listening, and it also enables us to have, um, you know, this flowing and non-flowing mode be, well, when you push, if I know that you're flowing, and I know that there's nothing in the way of it, then I can just go ahead and emit the data event without having to go through that internal buffer. Um, so that saves us a lot of uh, event emissions, and it saves us, you know, some some array juggling. And did you have to work with this in? in uh in, in C++, or is this all in like the user land it's space of JavaScript, or? Okay, so um, yeah, it's 100% in JavaScript in Node Core. Okay. So it's it's uh, the the term user land in a you know kernel OS user land kind of sense means is it in the kernel or not, basically. Um, in Node parlance, uh, there's Node Core and then there's User Land, where User Land is like the stuff in NPM and Node Core is all the stuff that's compiled into the binary. In this case, it's entirely in Node Core. It's in the uh, lib slash stream.js kind of stuff. Anybody else? Yeah. When you were designing these APIs, probably every platform that's ever existed has had to design some IO API, some sort of reader writer concept. Did you go look around at what other folks had done and sort of pick and choose? Did you just yeah. start from scratch? And if, if you picked something, some other, if you got ideas from somewhere else, like where were they? I'm just curious about that process. So the, um, the, biggest, the biggest motivation for, so there's two things. Like one, it's like where did you go and borrow stuff from? Um, and then the second, you know, ridiculous constraint is like, what changes were we able to make without breaking everybody's NPM uh, libraries? So that that actually constrains the problem pretty significantly, and it doesn't leave you a lot of room to a lot of wiggle. Room. But the uh, the biggest motivation for streams two was actually the um, you know read epoll and e would block kind of API, right? Where you you pull on a file descriptor. Once, and you get some notification that it's readable, you call read uh, until you get an error that says, sorry, I can't give you data right now because that would block. And then you go back to wait. Um, and that's kind of like the readable event and the, the read method and the read method returning null when there's no data. Um, also, we, it was a pretty straightforward way, there was a pretty straightforward way to kind of take that and wrap it in a stream one kind of API layer. The motivation for Streams 3 was just like, well, how do we make all these things work that currently suck? And how do we kind of like 
make the modality less of a pain in the ass to deal with. Um, there is actually some very interesting work being done by uh, what working group about uh, getting streams in the browser for stuff like, you know, a smarter XML HTTP request or like uh, what's the remote peer-to-peer -peer data thing? WebRTC. Yeah, WebRTC stuff um, so that you can get chunks of data through WebRTC with some kind of consistent API. So with, with the constraint of backwards compatibility somewhat lifted, it's, it's kind of nice and also kind of um, not so nice because on the on the one hand like that gives you freedom to do more interesting things on the other hand it gives you freedom to like walk around in circles and just do whatever and like scribble on a drawing board forever um, so that you know the constraint of keeping it in backwards keeping backwards compatibility is actually kind of limits your choices to the point where it's relatively easy to just pick the best one uh, yeah. In the days of Pope One, Ryan Dahl, he uh, tried right V <laughs> and uh, found it to be the same fast, if not slower, and lots more complicated. What's different now? Why is it faster and better? Um, he tried to write what? Right V. Like so, he did a right V. Oh, oh, and he, he was like, oh, it's roughly the same speed, but it's way more complicated. Let's not do it. So uh, there are a few things that are different. One is. Um, we had already kind of abstracted out the, the stream API layer, which he had. Um, so he was doing it in a way that had to be applicable to multiple different streams that didn't have any kind of base class. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is we're like, you know, two years or a year and a half worth of, uh, of V8 iteration. And like JavaScript objects are just faster to use now. Uh, another thing was I think he was doing something silly with, um, string encoding because we didn't have buffers at the time, or we didn't have, no, there was a low-level V8 API that we have now for, for writing strings that he didn't have at the time. Okay. So you had to keep references to strings around, you know, so that's like. So the, the write V stuff, though, is, it's nice. It is actually significantly <coughs> faster if you are on a path that's doing a lot of junk. Like, it. like live audio over HTTP? For example. For example. <laughs> yes, yeah, Um How have the benchmarks shifted with Streams 3? How have the benchmarks shifted with Streams 3? Not, um, not much. The, uh, the benchmarks have shifted tremendously because we're on V8 3.20 okay. instead of 3.16, I want to say. Um, also, there has been a bunch of libv changes that have changed the benchmarks considerably. So, basically, like there are a couple of use cases where it's like two thousand percent faster, and it actually is two thousand percent faster because like better V eight. Um, but uh, you know, I, I am. There's also a couple of cases where it's like a little bit slower, maybe than zero dot ten. Um, so we need to kind of. Figure that out. The the differentiation between like streams two and streams three, though, um, yeah, no no significant difference. The uh, the big win there was that when you push something and you're already in flowing mode, it'll just emit the data event right away rather than going through the buffer. Um, and so there's a couple of couple of code paths that got faster as a result of that. Otherwise, yeah, almost no change. I mean, most people won't notice stream three. Yeah. Just a quick one. Uh, you were talking about the uh, sizable constraint that backwards compatibility imposes. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, do you, so you sort of kept that constraint for now. Do you ever anticipate deviating? Do you ever anticipate deviating? So, anticipate deviating from backwards compatibility yes. in a significant way. Yes. Uh, not in still call it node. I mean, all, all software is great, and all software programmers make decisions that make lots of sense at the time, but there will never be a Perl 6 or a Python 3 on them. Like, I think that the responsible thing to do there is to give it a new name. Not a issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, the responsible thing to do if it's a new language or if it's a new platform is to pick a new name, like a gentleman, and <laughs> make a new project. 
Yeah. Is this where no comes in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, give it some other kind of name. We do demerit for trolling at, uh, at Joint, so you may end up walking away from demerits if you, yes. if you troll Isaac. <laughs> about, uh, I, I actually kind of enjoy being trolled. <laughs> we, uh, we all do, that's part of the problem. We're yeah. all addicted to being trolled. Yeah. Any that's other right. questions for Isaac? Or, uh, or, uh, no, sorry. Uh, what do you, what's your sense of the adoption of the streams to yeah, I mean, well, the nice thing about um, the nice thing about Node is that it's growing really fast. So, and and people who are new to something will just crack open the API docs of the latest stable version and do whatever it says to do. So, yeah. also remember that, that, that streams two and, and streams one are very similar in a, in, in a lot of important ways for developer. Not in. A lot of us have got software that runs on both 0.8 and, and, and because of all the work that Isaac did, sure backwards compatibility. I mean, you can get a lot of advantages of streams too, in, with pause working the way you think it should, and so on, yeah. with, without having to 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 change your mindset. I think. I mean, I think if you do backwards compatibility right, and it's not a hundred percent backwards compatible, it's like ninety nine percent backwards compatible. So there is a few like notable cases where. It was actually kind of a pain, and people had to go change their code. Um, but to the extent that you do actually maintain backwards compatibility, adoption's not really an issue. Like everybody has already adopted it because they're writing code that it's compatible with. As new users come on to Node, they're going to just assume that things work with streams too, and if they don't, they'll be, you know, sending pull requests and issuing bug reports and so forth. Um, the uh, the bugs and issues that we've gotten about it have been. You know, noisy enough to motivate writing streams three, which is not a rewrite. It's just like some relatively minor shifts um, and, and polish. And I think it's mostly been pretty well received. People get annoyed when they have to change a program. Like if you write something and then you upgrade Node and now you have to change it. It's like, God, I wrote that a year ago and I don't even remember how it works. And now I got to open it up again. You're a jerk. And like uh, <laughs> that's always going to happen. Um, but there hasn't been that much. Um, I do release engineering, so a lot of them. At what point do we essentially say there's a lot of things that would be nice to fix, but maybe you actually say, no, there needs to be a 1.0 release of Node itself that's stable as a trip. Because Stream 3 is nice, it's an addition to the API. No, it's actually not, isn't it? It's, it's somewhat of a reduction of the API, actually. It's, it's, we've reduced out a few bugs. Okay. Um, the well, no, you're, you're still changing the actual API, but you have to use three. The API changes a little right. bit. So uh, the point being is that at some point you have to say, the API for 1.0 is this. That's what 0.12 is. Right. And that's what, I mean, what, uh, what Isaac said is that 0.12 is going to get stabilized, and then it's 1.0. Like, uh, I mean, if we had a lower barrier, to, if we had a lower bar for what could count as stable, um, we could have probably called 0 0.8 1.0. Well, yeah, that's, 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 that's a... But, but I, mean, I, I can tell you that as, as a company that has been building things on nodes since 0 0.2, it, we are very clearly, as metodically, approaching stability. You look at that, I mean, Streams 2 is a very heavy piece of lift, and the actual effect on the code was actually surprisingly minimal. I don't think it was. Versus some of the changes from like 0 0.6, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. I mean, there have been, I mean. 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 was a nightmare. It, it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to use the, the nightmare word, but yes. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not saying we have to progress. The point being is that at some point we need to be able to tell the developer community we're on this particular release for stable, for truly stable. Things haven't changed. We will do bug fixes for this. Uh, as a community, we'll do bug fixes to get mm -hmm. that API. Well, see, and, and you know that Node always does this with even number releases. Yeah, right. even right. number releases are within, exactly the, that. within the even number release, are, they're exactly that. If you have a system that you released with 0 0.10.0, .0, it should still work with 0 0.10.99. Um, there are obviously some cases where you could be using some internal API or some weird edge case bug, and like, okay, there will be some changes. Uh, but in terms of the API, there's not even any API additions within a stable release. The, 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 there's not even V8 upgrades generally, unless there are critical V8 bugs. There, there are V8, uh, V8, within V8 a, patch with, versions. Right, right, yeah. V8 patch versions. So it's like, things I, within a stable range, things stay pretty stable. But anyway, I, um, 
Can we, uh, I want to, um, yeah, 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 exactly, thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. I finally got to the fat law that I knew was there. There will be no Perl, Python 3 or Perl 6. All right, so um, uh, I'm Brian Cantrell. I'm going to try to keep this uh, relatively brief. And where is, has it, is, is there anyone who has ever worked on a reader in this room so I can shoot them right now? The reader loves to do this, this game called the Find My Window. Uh, there we go, okay. All right, uh, disaster porn time, finally. Um, um, I am not, I'm something else, all right, excuse me, uh, and excuse me while I do the necessary view, and there we are. Okay, so it is finally time for some disaster, come on, there we go. Okay, disaster porn time, um, so, um, does anybody know what this is? Yes, then I do. Yes, yes, yes. Great. Right? It's a black box. It is a black box. Does anyone know which black box it is? Yeah. <laughs> from the Airbus. It's it is from Airbus. Yes, the we got that. Crash going to Brazil. Yes, there we go. Yeah, this is from Air France 447. So, um, this is the um, Honeywell the, the, brand. The, what's that? Honeywell brand. I I love the Honeywell brand on this. I mean, Honeywell is like, you know what we're gonna brand the living shit out of? The flight data recorder. It's like, you know there's only one reason you're looking at the flight data recorder. People are dead. Children have been orphaned. There, You have generated widows. And by the way, it's Honeywell, man. Honeywell's here. Oh, you thought I'm a thermostat? Yeah, well, where's your mom? She's dead. You want to know what happened? Ask me. Honeywell. So I, 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 I think that's pretty great. I really admire that they got so there. Um, so this is, um, this is a, a a great case. Um, Air France 447 crashes um, over the Atlantic, flying from Brazil to Paris, um, and no one knows why. Um, aircraft don't tend to crash mid-ocean. Um, there have been actually very few of these cases. Um, and they, they are reasoning based on, actually it's very interesting if you look at the amount of telemetry coming back off the aircraft. A lot of telemetry coming off the aircraft that was being processed by Airbus. They actually had a lot of of information about what the aircraft was doing, but not nearly as much as you would have in the flight data reporter. And they were able to reason that, the, or they, they hypothesized that the pitot tubes had frozen over. So it was believed that this was due to mechanical failure. Somehow there are three pitot tubes. The pitot tubes um, indicate your airspeed. If you were to ice over all three pitot tubes, you would lose your airspeed as an indicator and all sorts of chaos can happen. So that was the thought. Um, and they had really, um, people were kind of have to leave it at that because there was no flight data recorder. The flight data recorder was somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic um, and people had basically given up on it. And um, two years later, um, they, uh, they went back and through a very exhaustive mission, um, found the flight data recorder. I mean, these things have a beacon that emits for some period of time and then the, the batteries on that go dead. That guy's not branding himself, I guess. Um, but they actually found this thing and they determined that this was pilot error. This was, the, there were other contributing factors, but this is ultimately pilot error for reasons that people don't really understand. They did the wrong thing in a stall, um, which you think most pilots would understand. So they did the wrong thing in a stall, they decelerated instead of accelerated and the plane crashed. Um, but what does this highlight? This highlights the, the, the value of having data post-mortem on a system, uh, and I won't want to belabor the point, um, but in a, in a software system, um, we have got, the, we are blessed with these simple systems, and we pretty much always have the flight data recorder. What is it called? It's called the Corda. Um, how many of you have debugged from a core dump or, or a crash dump? Good, I'm in, in, in the right room. <laughs> uh, exactly. You've only done core dumps for cart Linux. I mean, that's so the, um, so um, you know, the, and I think actually just based on it, it's sort of a core dump. I mean, people know a core is due to magnetic core memory. I mean, this is it clearly from the animal brain of computing um, comes a core dump. And a core dump contains a, a, a static state. It's all of our in-memory state. And um, we can learn a lot from a core dump. And I think that um, even now we are in our infancy about, if you look at the amount of things that, that, that the NTSB does, National Transportation Safety Board does with a flight data recorder, we are nowhere near being able to do what they do um, with, with a, um, a core and crash up. Now, in part because our systems, thankfully, don't involve loss of life. There are generally no widows and orphans. They're just some very angry people. Um, but th there's so much we can do um, with these core crash dumps. Um, and you know, I, I am a, a fetishist when it comes to these things. Um, 
So uh, a lot of advantages when you're debugging this way, um, the, um, the uh, when you debug in situ, um, you know you can. Oops, darn. Oh, and that's. Uh, are we auto searching? We just did. This unfortunately, this projector is steam powered, and it is. Um, <laughs> huh. Should I go get the one? What's that? That may be a layup, actually. Was an that was an audible yeah, click. I heard an audible click. All right. Um, <laughs> you guys have lost power. Or <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> right. So, of course, I, I, I mean, it is ironic, actually, that um, I, I am, I do love disaster porn, but not necessarily in the middle of a talk that I'm giving. Um, okay. So, um, let's, um, suffice it to say that um, we've got a lot of advantages when we're debugging these, these systems. In particular, one of the things that I love about them is when you have a core crash dump, you can keep it around forever. Um, and because I, I also think that we have, we have so much state in a running system. And when that application dumps core, when you have that 70 gig Erlang VM that decides to croak, to pick a hypothetical example, because Erlang actually never crashes, because Erlang has no bugs, as you would know from, <laughs> from their smugness. Um, but <laughs> it, 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 if, hypothetically, um, an Erlang VM were, were to crash, it, I mean, in that, I mean, you have 70 gigabytes of, of data there, and you have this incredible running system that is now like Pompeii, frozen in time. And what can we go learn about that system? Um, and I've always kind of been interested in this problem. One of the things we did at Sun back in the day um, is we uh, we got the uh, there we go, go ahead, bring in the passive here. Um, it's a say. A little human cluster management here. Um, it's good. Uh, manual failover. Exactly. Manual failover. Um, hey, do you guys know when the system's going to be back up? Because uh, people are kind of asking me about it. And, and uh, so, is there anything I can do to help here? Or, uh, yeah. Oh, well, it looks like you guys got it. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Uh, this is good. Um, so, um, And so one of the things we've done, or the, that we did back in the day, um, is um, actually look at a kernel crash dump and find uh, kernel memory leaks by garbage collecting the kernel. Um, so you, it's a C-based system, but you, you do pointer chasing following the root set, and you can actually find memory leaks. And we found tons and tons and tons and tons of memory leaks with the sample find leaks. Um, and at the time, back at Sun, um, I, I generated the, um, this little goober, how did this thing get so confused, um, called uh, Leakbot. That would uh, and Leakbot would run around and look at core dumps and find the uh, find uh, crash dumps, kernel crash dumps, and find stack traces. Thanks, perfect guys, thank you. Um, uh, and it, it would find these stack traces, and I was kind of trying to live the dream um, of being able to close the loop. Um, and the loop that I wanted to close was not necessarily taunting my coworkers about Mario Kart, which <laughs> admittedly is a much higher calling. The the the, the loop that, that I wanted to close was being able to pick up a core crash dump and being able to analyze it automatically to see all the things we can find about it. And then if we have a new way, a new way of thinking about a core or crash dump, I want to go over all past core and crash dumps, and I want to use that to try to understand um, the, the, the system in perhaps a new way. Um, there, unfortunately, that, the, the, there's a data management problem there that's really thorny. Dump management is really, really annoying. These things are big. 70 gig Erlang VMs are 70 gigs, and 70 gigs is actually a lot of data. And it's a, it's a pain in the ass to move. And so you tend to like debug these things once, and then you run out of storage, and you're kind of deleting these things, and it's really annoying. So um, of course, um, enter, enter Manta. Um, as, 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 a, as a quick and a brief aside, I want to talk about uh, truly the, the, the epic rap battle of computer science history. Um, and that is, sorry, I, I injured my knee, and I watched way too much epic rap battle on YouTube. That stuff, I find that shit way, way, way too funny. Um, so, um, Doug McIlroy v. Don Knuth, Computer Science Smackdown. So, um, do people know who Doug McIlroy is? Yes. Doug McIlroy gave us? Unix. Ah, oh, he gives Unix. Close. Wow. Wow. You had the, 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 the pipe. The pipe. The, the, but you're close. I mean, you might, but you may make the argument, I think the pipe is Unix. That's why I, um, amazingly, Unix did exist for a very short period of time without the pipe. McIlroy actually from the 60s was trying to convince those guys to implement a Python construct. Um, and actually, I mean, I think you could actually make the argument that much of what we think about in terms of the Unix philosophy, we owe actually to McIlroy more than, than to, to Ken Thompson or, or Dennis Ritchie. So um, Doug McIlroy is the inventor of the pipe. Don Knuth, of course, forefather of, of computer science, 
um, and uh, one of the pioneers of, of, of computing. So the epic rap battle is this challenge posed by John Bentley in 1986. Um, John Bentley programming pearls. The, the challenge is to read a file of text, determine the end most frequently used words, and print out a sorted list of those words along with their frequencies. If you are in you know, DevOps, or even if you were in software engineering, this is a totally reasonable interview question for a 22-year-old, or perhaps even an intern, right? This is actually a very straightforward problem, because clearly you would solve this with a Unix pipeline. Not so if you're Don Knuth. Don Knuth writes an elaborate program in a new system he has derived, de developed, called WEB, all capitals, of course. Um, and this is a Pascal-like, this is part of his literate programming thing about good ideas and bad ideas. This is not necessarily the good idea column. Um, and so he, and he develops this purpose-built algorithm, and there are like eight pages of description of this algorithm and, and its beauty and so on. Um, that's McIlroy's solution. Owned. Um, so, um, I mean, and, and this is, again, circa 1986. Um, McIlroy's solution was faster. Um, and, and that was the, the, the beauty is that not only was it so much simpler, so much more maintainable, so much easier to understand, it was actually faster. Um, so, and this is actually a triumph of the, the, the Unix philosophy, um, which I think is the single most important thought revolution in software systems, that part of the reason we don't have the, system, the problem we have in biological systems of this just rampant complexity is because we invent these lines of abstraction. And what Uni Unix philosophy says is, draw those boundaries as tightly as you can and as small as you can and then take these things that are very well understood and then put them together in new ways. The Unix philosophy is small tools doing well-defined jobs and stringing them together in new and interesting ways. So Manta, as, you, as you've already seen, um, but just to, to rephrase the, the McIlroy challenge in Manta, um, Manta is the Unix philosophy brought to big data. Um, and Yes, I do believe that we are engaged in an epic battle between complexity and, and simplicity and elegance computing systems. And yes, I do believe that this is represented between the framework people and the library people. Um, and if you're a framework person, um, that's okay. You're just on the opposite side of an epic battle between good and evil. Um, <laughs> the, and the, 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 the question is, who owns flow of control? And is flow of control owned by the framework? And I kind of call into you in these very complicated contexts. Or do you own flow of control, and I give you a bunch of libraries that, that you call into, uh, be they Unix pipelines or what have you. So I'm, a, I'm obviously a library bigot, a Unix bigot, um, and this is the way we would phrase that in terms, uh, in terms of Manta. So, um, and Manta actually brings compute the data, which again, you saw, I mean, it, it, it's great that you can do this, but this is kind of a trivial example, obviously, I mean, who would actually do this? Um, you can use it to manage core and crash terms, but all that's actually pales in relevance to Cartlytics, which of course is the actual purpose of Manta. Um, but we can use this implementation detail, this artifact, to do other interesting things. So um, Thoth is the system that I developed that is, um, that is really, I developed actually out of need because Manta was generating so many core dumps, God love it. Um, so we're developing a distributed system. Um, one of the things that, that um, we believe fervently in is that if there's an error in the system, it, it, many node processes and so on, we should panic abort dump core. And when we would have a bug in a big distributed system, you could easily end up with 300 core dumps overnight. And it's like, OK, God, how do we make sense of these things? Um, fortunately, we have Manta um, in a system that allows us to do this. Uh, in order to be able to do this, what we want to be able to do is store a dump in Manta, and then we need to be able to debug it interactively. So this required something that we didn't have before in Manta, uh, and that's the ability to interactively, uh, to, or to interact with a job as it's running. Um, and I was kind of bemoaning this, and I guess just loudly enough, because Josh did um, what we call mlogin, which allows you to actually log in to, and effectively log into an object. So I want to actually show you this. I want to be mindful of time, but also um, actually show you what the system looks like. Can you get bigger? Yeah, I'm going to make it bigger right now. That's, all right, is that better? Hopefully. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, and, um, so good. So I'm going to run Thoth. Thoth is going to will run a Thoth LS there. And then I'm going to make, and yes, I'm going to make this bigger as well. So that's actually kicked off a, a Manta job. And I want to show you what that's doing. Um, so when we upload dumps, we, um, they get uploaded into Thoth. And then we do a little bit of analysis on that dump. And we create a little JSON payload that lives behind, beside it. So if I do an mjob get on that thing, this is going to show us all sorts of things about our job. And this is the, the actual job that this thing is running. So this is running. 
um, this is doing an NLS of a directory, Thoth store Thoth. Um, it's calling what God intended, awk. Um, yes, Manta. <laughs> Dave would tell you that the purpose of Manta is to be able to, to auto taunt his coworkers. I would tell you that Manta is the second coming of, of awk, and that awk has come again to judge the living and the dead. Um, so um, you should repent now and use awk. Um, so we are uh, we're using awk to to essentially take those and and print those out as full paths. Then we're piping that through to XARGs, God bless it, and to a program called MCAT. And what this says is I want to take these objects, and these are the objects I want to op I, I want to operate on in the next phase. In that phase, this looks like a mess, but it's actually not as bad as it looks. Um, and let me add, I'll pipe that through to JSON phases one dot exec, and you can see a little bit a little more a little easier to see what this is doing. What this is doing is taking the input file. And it, you can kind of, it, this is some uh, kind of optimizing this, but it's, it's pulling out some fields from this JSON payload, um, and then it's, it's printing, reprinting that out as a JSON payload, and then sending that off to our reduce phase. Um, what this allows us to do, this is basically a very cheap, dirty, disgusting table scan. Right? What, what this is running in parallel on a bunch of objects, and then the reduce phase is printing it out. It's, it's disgusting, but it's so quick and so easy. Um, and it allows us to actually get a, here, a listing of all of our dumps. And if I actually want to debug one of these, like I, I, so this is actually from Manta right now. If Manta were to start core dumping, we'd see them. And we've got like this node core dump. And so if I, if I do a thought debug on that, this is going to create a job on this object. And now it has actually logged me in somewhere in the, the Manta cloud. I am now logged in and interactively, I am now in MDB. And I'm going through Josh's software um, so if I do a dollar C, for example, I will get a stack trace, colon colon stack, might be a little more intuitive, and you can see that I'm in LWP kill. Um, oh, of course, I'm in zero x a two d zero a three seven six. That makes sense. Um, being called by zero x b b nine four b b f c four. This gets it gets us to another kind of crushing issue, which is how do you make sense of a node program from a core dump? Um, and I, the the bad news is that this is an impossible problem. Um, and there's no way we can possibly get the state, uh, all that VM state from a core dump. The good news is that Dave Pacheco did not realize this was an impossible problem when he endeavored to solve it, and he actually solved it not knowing that it was actually impossible, which is terrific. Um, so I, I, I can actually load Dave here. Um, Dave should have named, just named this module after himself, so you are required to beckon him um, from heaven and visit the mortals. Um, dear Dave, I hope this finds you well. <laughs> Can you please tell me where I am in my program? And there's a colon colon JS stack, which tells me where I was in JavaScript. Fatal exception, um, calling an arguments adapter frame, event or emit, calling C a panic. And if I run that with the minus V option, it actually tells me my objects. And I can actually JS print that and get a JavaScript object. Wow. What the hell is that? That's a fun one. Uh, duplicate key violates unique constraint, Manta P key. Well, Dave might be looking at this dump later. <laughs> that just feels like danger. Animal brain. Wrong. And it feels like I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe that, or, or, I don't know what that is. Why is it exciting? But the, the, that's a JavaScript object. Um, the, um, this is why, I mean, this is the advantage of Cartletics. You never know what you're going to find. What's that? Uh, what's Parks? <laughs> So I will bash out to parts Manta input file. That shows me the actual arguments. And you want parts minus Z for the environment variables? Does that help? You're, oh, it's more right. Oh, it's more interesting. So key value store. Interesting. Well, this looks like an exciting dump. I can't wait to debug this one. Um, <laughs> you know, every, I was kind of hoping it was one of these trivial dumps. But that actually does not look like that. That, that actually looks kind of saucy and exciting. Um, but the uh, and what we were able to do is is then interact, and we can do things like we can do a find JS objects. Um, this is you know where we find all JavaScript ob JavaScript objects um, in the dump. I probably should look to see how big this thing is um, before I went off and ran that. Um, the uh, in any case, uh, and actually, I will do um, a thoth JSON dump. So that is actually going to be um, excuse me. Uh, user um, this will actually that is the actual core dump um, from a Manta perspective. 
and just to see how actually big that sucker is. Um, oh, it's, oh, there we are, it actually finished over here. Thank you, so I was checking to see if it, so this is all of the JavaScript objects um, in the, um, in, in the stump, and we can go and understand the system state and so on, um, which is, of course, extremely valuable. Then once I've debugged it, maybe I want to mark it or something. Unthoth allows you to do all that, um, allows you to, to set a ticket and so on. What gets really interesting is being able to auto-analyze things, and in particular, acting on a, an idea that Dave had. Um, we, uh, and I think if I look at some of my auto-diagnose things, I've got like, uh, these are little diagnosers that can run, and, uh, and actually, let me take this thing. And then, I'll, and then I will stop. Um, so um, this is a little auto analyzer that runs in the context of a job. And what this thing does is it pulls out the service that was responsible for the dump. It says, if I'm, I'm only interested if this is a core file, um, I'm going to look for the SMF fMRI, um, which tells us the service that it was associated with. And then things are going to get saucy. Because what it does is it actually goes back into Manta and looks for the log associated with the service at the time of failure, goes through the log, finds the actual string relevant to the actual panic, pulls that out and staples that onto the dump, and then we have another analyzer that runs over that looking for a particular string. Um, so with Manta, it's really easy to, to, I mean, like the Lego bricks, you can build these systems really quickly. Um, and I found it was, it, it was actually, it was fun. Admittedly, like this kind of stuff, I get like a feeling in my loins when I, when I look at dumps like this. Show us. I, um, I might, actually, I might. The, 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 you, the, don't, don't tap me. Um, but the, uh, from our perspective, um, I am getting close to living the dream of every time an application dumps core or a system dies with a crash dump anywhere in the universe, it is collect collected in a giant heap un under which I am buried, um, doing nothing but looking at core and crash dumps for the rest of my life, which is actually all I ever wanted to do. <laughs> with that, th thank and with that, my clothes are still on. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and I know what you're thinking, I know what you're thinking. Boy, that was the weirdest, most irrelevant talk I've ever seen in my life. And with that, I'd like to introduce Adam Levin. <laughs> I feel like following Brian every time is like walking on the stage where someone has just screamed, I'm not crazy, and then stormed off. <laughs> like, hey, everybody. Hey, it's me. He's fine. Uh, he's just off his medication. Yeah, that's right. Stay with those meds, Brian. Um, all right, so uh, this is not so much a presentation as it is a story, and it is a story of heroism. And it's not my heroism, it's um, heroism of a colleague of mine, uh, Jeremy Jones, who actually just had his first child two days ago. So that's why he's not here. Um, so I, I told him at the time that this was the stuff of like lyric poetry, um, but I didn't have time to write it. Um, so who here, so everyone showed their hands for core files, just hold them up and tell them, you put them down when you're done here. So. Um, uh, M who's, who's debugged from core files, who's debugged using MDB, who's debugged using MDB on the kernel, who's debugged using MDB on a live kernel KMDB, who's debugged using KMDB on a live kernel diving into a process. Come on, colon, colon, context. Who's actually used it? Who's debugged the problem? Successfully. Successfully. One hand remains. I once dug out a stack. And yeah, <laughs> and uh, I'll show you. So um, as Brian um, as Brian was mentioning earlier, um, these problems when um, when you actually dump a core, or dump a crash dump, are in some ways easier. You can spend a lot of time um, thinking about it and, and sifting through it and building new analysis tools. When you have a problem where there is no crash dump or there's no core file, um, it can be just brutal. We had one of these at Delphix. Oh, um, I'm Adam Levendahl. I work at Delphix. We had one of these problems at Delphix where we would hang very early in boot. Too early to get a core file, too early to send an NMI. We sent in uh, KMDB, um, found out that startd was hanging, uh, sent in <laughs> code code context. So this is super early in boot. Um, and just to, to feel a little of the, bit of the pain, I want to show off cold and cold context um, and, and show what it's like. So um, I'm, I'm just here, uh, can, can folks see this more or less. Um, I, I'm here uh, on you know one part of the system, is not being able to type. Um, and we're going to a dump. So this is a dump I've created um, 
for the purpose of this talk, and I have all of the kernel pages and the user pages in there. So the first thing you do is you say, uh, whoops, you tab complete, which works. Thank you, um, thank you Rob and, and Matt Amder. Um, and it's great. Um, so I look for start D and I run colon colon context. So now I'm in this process. So let's look at the stack. Nope. And let's look at the registers. Also no. And maybe <laughs> these other things work, but they don't. <laughs> so that's 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 step one to using colon colon content, remembering how horrible it is. Then you don't know how to get out of it, so you start again. <laughs> and you is, is there a way to get out of it? Does anyone know? Uh, so you you grab start D again, and then you walk the threads. Uh, walk the thread. Really? Oh, that. All right. Learn something that I hope they never use. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna print my K thread T. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tab complete this guy because I can. Um, and L to P regs. And I'm gonna print the regs. Oh god. <laughs> Struct. Oh god. I'm in the bad place. <laughs> regs. <laughs> Your yep, I'm going to print regs, and I'm going to do R, R, T. So now I've got the registers that I wanted. Now I'm ready to call and call in context. <laughs> uh, and I can... Syntactic sugar. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> yeah, exactly, syntactic sugar. So now I'm going to take these, and because I know how extracts are constructed, I can walk the stack on my own. Right? No <laughs> problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> and then and then I can disassemble this stuff, because these are just instructions. Uh, and I can disassemble it, but I, I forgot that actually this is a 32-bit process, so then I have to remember all the stuff I did a million years ago. Uh, this asms, which is a command. This mode, IA32, so I'm switching to look at IA32. 16 added by me. <laughs> Great. Use IA16. Making that IA16 support. I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so now I've, I've basically spent a lot of time remembering how to do stuff and still getting nowhere. So this is where where my colleague Jeremy got, um, and except for he was doing it with KMDB, which is even more horrible. Um, so then, um, Jeremy, this is where I would have. Uh, I should mention I, I I have a small role in this story. Uh, and it's coming up, but it, it might not be where you expect. So, um, Jeremy um, just pursued this doggedly, and um, and we didn't kind of know where he went at night, but it turns out where he was going was into this, this very um, strange place. So, um, we run all of our stuff inside of VMware, and um, VMware has this tool called VMSS to core. And you can take the live, uh, basically the, the memory state of your VM, and produce a, core, uh, a crash dump from it. It's kind of amazing, actually. Um, it never didn't work um, on Solaris, on versions of Solaris that we were using, on versions of Lumos that we were using, because it was built for like Solaris 2.6 or something. Um, and um, whatever, we're, we're recording, but I will deny this in the future, and it's being recorded. We like stole a version from inside of VMware. We had some friends who like sent us the good stuff, and uh, so we, we produced it, but it didn't have the pages we needed. So Jeremy discovered this thing called volatility. Uh, has anyone ever heard of volatility before? It is a, one of these awesome open source tools. Do you ever, you ever feel like um, you like write down six things and put them on a card and there's like some open source project that combines all of them? This is a thing that takes things from Zen or VMware or KVM and processes those memory images and emits it in whatever other memory image type that you like. So it takes like KVM state and produces like a Linux crash dump. And like, wow, I, who, who did this? But it's, it is awesome. And so what Jeremy did is he wrote 2,000 lines of, of Python code to take the, this volatility, what volatility gave him, which would, would process the VMware uh, VMSS file, the snapshot of, of that state, and produced a, um, a kernel, uh, a, 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 a Lumos crash dump. Um, let's see if I can pull that up just so that you can uh, see how amazing that is. So it is just like line after line of like uh, deciphering kernel uh, structures and pulling them apart and spitting out elf and um, 
and creating this crash dump. And Jeremy was just kind of like, oh yeah, I did that. That is like rocket surgery, just just right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that, so that got us to the point where we had the crash dump with all the user pages, but it still didn't solve the problem. So then Jeremy um, ascended the, this mountain that I have walked past, you know, hundreds of times. It is Kong Kong G-Core Mountain. And this, this is the, the dream of taking a crash dump, which you know has all of the information that you want, and producing a core file so you can just use those tools that you already know how to use and you don't have to suffer through Kong Kong context. And it, it, you know, when, I, when I pitched it to him, um, it, was, it, was, um, it was like, oh, you know, we have, we have libproc and it knows how to create a core file, and we have MDB and it knows how to look at processes. All you have to do is stick those together. Is, that, is, is how I conned him into doing the thing that I had seen too much of a pain in the ass for like 10 years of my career, maybe longer. Um, anyway, I, don't, I won't have a show of hands of how many people have talked to or heard me talk about Kong Kong G Core over the course of my career. So um, what he did was he first vectorized libproc, and then he created this translation layer. And he, and, he, um, and he invoked this facility in libproc that I added many years ago called PG Core, which creates a core file from this psproc handle. Now you're thinking, this is where I'm gonna claim credit for like starting the whole thing. This is not where I enter the story. So um, I'll show you Jeremy's version of MDP. Uh, here, uh, one, now Jeremy's like in the hospital with his wife, so I kind of am doing this a little bit without his permission, except for some text file. He's like, if you can, I mean, some text message. If you can find it, he said, I can demo it. So I found it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got, uh, again, start D, and I'm going to run it just through G core. And this is some debug code, but at the end of it, what we get is a core file. And I can go to that core file, core.service.startd48, and I can run it. And it is like a whole functioning core file that we ripped out of, like from the clutches of VMware through this volatility thing into a crash dump. So I don't want to point, Jeremy by the, at this point has written like thousands, if not maybe like 10,000 lines of code to debug this one problem. <laughs> and now this is where I come to the story. <laughs> because I introduced the bug. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be like a 10 line fix. Um, so uh, this, um, uh, you know, to, to just kind of wrap this up, um, this I think is one of the most amazing feats of, of building tools out of anger um, you know, to, to, to solve this um, problem that was otherwise just nearly impossible to debug. I would say possibly impossible to debug, just based on the amount of time we had all kind of spent thinking about and investigating, um, and the power of, of these right tools. So, thank you, Jeremy. What are the alt stuff? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll show you that. So like, you can run, I mean, like, love server files. Uh, some of it is a little faked up. I mean, what what do you want? P flags? I think they're just I just well done lines. But, but I, I yeah, I mean any P two we can run is, is a miracle, obviously. Oh yeah, exactly. So P files are. Yep. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So you you have like a bunch of you know stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so do you have P files? Uh, I don't know. Probably not because we don't because we I, I bet this is gonna be faked up. Do you have some stuff you don't have all? You don't have like the stuff that you need to agent other people to send and get. We could totally run, but part of this we need to. I think what we need to do with the key files is write it so it's not sending the agent. So there's there's a um, there's like a slash proc primitive that that we could use to, to fake all this stuff up. Um, but what Jeremy effectively had to do is take a lot of slash proc code and reproduce it in MDB. All of the marshalling of kernel data structures. Into the, the stable data structures um, that we, that the debuggers can see. Any other things you guys want to see? What what ultimately was the problem? The problem actually the problem was um, was pretty fascinating. The problem. So I'll blame Java at the beginning. Let me just start. From there. <laughs> so um, there's a problem that in fact um, 
I, I was standing right here as I was telling Brian this for the first time as he was debugging this problem. So, um, recent versions of the I was debugging that problem, by the way. <laughs> oh, really? I, 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 I was going to get Java your fucking Elastic Search problem. It all, it's uh, all coming together. So, <laughs> so um, uh, the JVM, for whatever reason, is compiled in a way where um, the JStack helper is not sent down to the kernel. The JStack helper is what's, what lets dtrace understand what Java stack traces look like from any point. Um, so frustratingly, they, they basically compiled this thing wrong, and arguably, we kind of messed up the way that um, you embed these these helper descriptions, or, or it's confusing, or, the, or whatever, or the dog ate the JVM homework or something. So I wrote this um, this thing called an audit library, where you attach it to the JVM when you run it, so that it sends down the information that the kernel needs um, forcibly. So anytime you run Java, um, we go and grab Datrius is able to get the information that it needs. In doing that, I found a problem with all audit libraries. So audit libraries are a facility in the Illumos linker and the Solaris linker. And this is a problem that has existed since the beginning of audit libraries. They just like can't work by design. In particular, there's a race condition between the, um, the allocator that you need to have for your audit library and like forks. I know this is incredibly esoteric, but it's, it is, it's one of these nasty problems. Um, and it just, it never worked. So I came up with a solution, which also totally broken by design. It got us by this, this kind of proximate issue. But the, the basic problem is, uh, is that audit libraries just need to be treated much more specially. So um, what we, we did is went in and changed it so that like audit libraries can't fork, they can't create threads, and they can't participate in um, like fork safety because they're already implicitly fork safe. And, and uh, just the uh, GNU guys also took it on one as well. Took that, oh, really? They took it lock, stock, and barrel. Part of their My guess is that it's broken. My guess, no, it is broken. They, they took all I mean, it's like, so for example, every example in the Sun Linkers and Libraries Guide, like, will dev on. <laughs> for example. Okay. Any other questions? Other stuff I can show you about this nifty crash stuff? Yeah, Adam. Is this one of those bugs you could have found if you had done a binary search on your commit history? Huh. Um, no, because it wasn't a reproducible boot hang. Um, it was one of, and it was, it was like most of these pathological boot hangs. Like the, the harder you thought about it, like the less you could reproduce it. You know, like the week when you're like, guys, let's just solve this. No one would hit it. And then we thought maybe we'll just never hit this again. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you would hit it every time. It's like a plague. Well, like surely no customer would hit it. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> you know that that it was we built infrastructure to like save the VMs that were hung, so that they, Jeremy could go back and look at them later. Yeah. So um, there might have been some of that, but it's also one of these squirrely things that it's like a timing thing. And you're um, and you never know is is it this thing that's actually chasing away? Is it actually gone or? So yeah, so answer maybe, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that would have been a very ironic end to it. <laughs> um, sorry. Great. Uh, thank you. And Matt, do you want to? Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I, I, I've not actually personally met Jeremy. I'm not actually sure he exists. He may have been actually. Um, well, it's too bad he already has a baby because I want to have this. Um, all right, so uh, now Matt Aarons, um, also Delphix, uh, co inventor of ZFS. All right, um, I'm going to talk about ZFS. Surprise, surprise. Um, if I can find the right button. This is the button board. Right. Um, so, who here knows what ZFS is? So many hands. Great. Who here has used ZFS? Oh, so great. So many hands. So, uh, for those who do not raise their, raise their hands, ZFS is a storage system that combines the features of a file system and volume manager. Um, it's a local file system, so it stores files on a disk that is attached to your computer, um, as opposed to something like NFS or um, one of these network file system things. Um, so <laughs> here, it, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, 
like how ZFS came to be and where it is now. Um, so a little bit about history and then about some recent features and future work that we're working on. So ZFS uh, was started about back in 2001 by myself and Jeff Bonwick at Sun Microsystems. Um, we worked on it uh, with a growing team of about a dozen people, released the code in 2005 when Open Solaris uh, was created by Sun. Um, and uh, t there was a lot of enthusiasm around that project and the, but, um, and around the open sourcing of it. But the development model for basically the next five years was that Sun developed code and then threw it over the wall. And everybody loved it and they talked about it and they used it. Um, and it really enabled a lot of, uh, um, it, it started, to, started to become a real solid user production system that was enabled a lot of uh, enterprise products like, for example, the Sun 7000 um, ZFS storage appliance um, around 2008. But uh, there's this really kind of big event in 2010 um, <laughs> that happened with Sun, um, which was that Oracle purchased Sun and then stopped contributing the source code to ZFS. So this really raised a lot of questions in the community about like, well, uh, Sun has been giving us all this great source code and um, continuing to develop it and make awesome features in ZFS. What's going to happen now that Oracle isn't doing that anymore? Um, so uh, what happened was that a lot of the companies that had been um, using the ZFS source code uh, realized that, well, we can't rely on Oracle to do this anymore for us. So we need to create an actually open community um, called Lumos <coughs> to uh, develop ZFS totally in the open. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the history from the Sun, Oracle, Illumos point of view. Um, meanwhile, ZFS was also ported to Linux and um, FreeBSD and macOS. Um, so what is ZFS? You know, it's a bunch of code. It runs on a bunch of different platforms. Um, but really, if there's only one thing that you take away from this presentation, it's that um, ZFS is not just an Oracle technology, it's not just an Illumos technology. Um, it, it lives on, on many different platforms. Um, there's lots of people that are working on ZFS, on uh, Illumos, on uh, FreeBSD, on Linux, um, some of them in this room, besides myself. Um, and really, uh, the goal of OpenZFS is to um, get people working together on all these platforms to make ZFS featureful and perform well on every platform. So what are we really talking about? Like this is all great, like pie in the sky, everything's gonna be great, everybody loves each other and we're all gonna make everything awesome. So um, the three main communities working on ZFS are the most FreeBSD and Linux. Um, there's like hundreds and hundreds of commits on every one of these platforms, which is amazing. There's tons of contributors, um, you know, over, uh, you know, over 100 contributors if you have those all together. And there's a lot of companies that are um, creating products that are really based on uh, ZFS, and in particular on OpenZFS, the open source version of ZFS that exists on these platforms, um, as opposed to uh, Oracle's closed source ZFS. All right, so any questions about um, the love fest of OpenZFS before we move on to um, what are the awesome features that are in OpenZFS? So Oracle is actually continuing now open yeah, so Oracle is continuing to develop, to develop a closed source ZFS, which continues to be the foundation of, like, the, it's in Solaris, it's in the ZFS storage appliance, um, but not in anyone else's products. And since this fork, there's no way to make it compatible with the other thing. That isn't really under our control, so, I mean, the, the open ZFS code is open source, so uh, we would love it if Oracle um, took those changes and made their version of it compatible with the open source version. Um, we would love it if they opened their, um, you know, their on this format specs uh, so that we could implement a compatible version. But unfortunately, you know, we're doing everything that we can. Um. <coughs> so they, Oracle also cannot take the OpenCFS. The things that they contribute to OpenCFS, Oracle does not copyright on and can't take without violating. So yeah. Well, they can't take it without and also releasing without their, their, their source of genius, which is why they probably won't do it. And by probably, I mean they won't do it. <laughs> um, <coughs> cool. So um, I wanted to kind of point out a few recent developments. This is our recent kind of like last two years um, that are in OpenZFS. 
these are mostly available on all the platforms, including like Smart OS and um, Omni OS uh, that are based on Lumos and FreeBSD and Linux. So um, these are things that uh, we've been working on for a while. Um, it's like ZFS send stream size estimation. So for those of you who don't know in progress reporting, uh, which Bill worked on, so uh, ZFS send is used for remote replication. Um, and before this, uh, you could do a ZFS send, but you didn't really know like how big was that. So how long is it going to take before uh, that completes? Do I, you know, I've been waiting for like a day. Is it going? Is it almost done, or is it going to take another day? Um, so now we're able to um, compute that and, help and give you that information. Um, we return the test suite to working order um, and uh, created new tests for all these new features that we're talking about. Um, we've done a ton of performance fixes. So um, one of the things that we do at Delphix, so I should say, I work at Delphix um, with Adam, and uh, we use ZFS uh, snapshots and clones really heavily so um, to create virtual copies of databases. So uh, one of the issues that we ran into is that if you have a lot of, lot of clones, then um, all of those clones, like they share all, this sp all their space on disk, which is great, that's why we're using them. Um, but when you, s when you are actually reading that data off disk into memory, we keep one copy <coughs> for, every, um, for every clone in memory. So you're just keeping multiple copies of the exact same data in memory. So um, our other colleague, George Wilson, um, implemented the single copy arc so that you can get massive scaling of your memory to um, cache that data. Um, another guy from the um, Illumis, from the open source community um, implemented compressed L2 arc. So the L2 arc is used for um, caching uh, data on like an SSD or other like really fast uh, disk-like disk device. Um, and so he implemented compression um, so that uh, that data is used more efficiently, or that space is used more efficiently. Um, we also implemented background destroy of file systems and um, over 100x faster destroying of clones. Um, this is due to like a bug that nobody ever noticed in, uh, at Oracle, but uh, we we're really using clones um, a lot. So um, Chris Seidel, who is also here, another colleague, um, implemented uh, the background destroy of file systems. So this is, you can do ZFS destroy. Um, it, it's gone, it's removed from the namespace, and then we reclaim the space um, in the background. Um, it would because uh, the, I mean, the single copy arc, arc is just going to make memory caching more efficient. So you're going to be able to fit more stuff into memory, and um, deleting of uh, file systems or snapshots. The slowest part of that is reading all the metadata off disk. So you're going to be able to cache more stuff, including that metadata. So um, it's going to help it like it helps everything that needs to read stuff off this. That kind of makes sense. Um, LZ4. We're using LZ4. Yeah. All you have to do is LZ4. Yeah. So um, uh, this guy, Sasso, he also uh, implemented LZ4 compression in ZFS, um, which I think I have on another, another slide, um, which is like a newer compression algorithm. It's much faster and also compresses a little bit better than the LZJB, which is kind of the default in ZFS. Um, yeah, that's super great. Um, it basically, it, it makes compression even more free than it already was before. Um, just like, we should basically make compression equal to LZ4 the default, because it's very low cost. Um, we've done a lot of um, usability issues in the CLI. So one of the um, reasons that we implemented ZFS to begin with was to end the suffering of system administrators um, who had been working for too long on systems where they had you know, dozens of file systems and dozens of disks and file systems that map to volume managers and very difficult to administer. So um, we wanted to uh, end that suffering by creating an easy to use um, a product that combined all these different concepts into one um, set of into, one, into a simple set of concepts that maps to what the system administrators, um, how, they, how they think about their storage. Um, and we've been continuing to that kind of uh, march towards usability um, with some of these command line syntactic sugar-ish things, um, uh, as well as um, kind of usability things. So um, that's great uh, for people that are using ZFS from the command line, like system administrators. 
But uh, what about the people who are building their products on ZFS? Um, the programs that they're writing aren't uh, aren't typing things in. It, you know, it doesn't matter if they need an additional flag or to type it through some other thing. Um, they really need an uh, interface which is a programmatic interface with well-defined error semantics. Um, that's a that's thread safe. That has a uh, well-defined atomicity of the operations. Um, so we implemented libzfs core, uh, which is a library interface um, for doing ZFS administrative operations. So things that you normally do with like the ZFS command um, on the command line. Um, all right, here's, here's where I mentioned LZ4 compression, which is super great. Um, and also support for things like um, 4K sector size devices. Okay, cool. So um, now I have a list of awesome things that we're working on. Um, I kind of, I don't want to take up too much time. So uh, any questions so far about these things or ZFS or what we're going to be working on and how close it is being done and who you need to bug in this room to get it done sooner? <laughs> yeah. Um, for the libgf uh, core, um, is there a way to invoke that like over a network uh, or other than just linking it? Um, no, okay. it's just like a a, li a regular old library. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, as an application developer, are there features in particular that I should care about? Um, I would say as an application developer, the things that I would most look at are uh, like snapshots and clones. Um, so the things like you know compression and whatnot, those are all great. Um, I would look at those from a, if you're like building a system or, or building a box that has these inside of it. But from application developer, snapshots and clones are really what's going to um, enable you to do things that you couldn't do before. Um, so uh, like if you are um, if you want to be able to know what the state of the system was, what the state of the file system was at a previous point in time, you know, snapshots can do that for you in a very uh, inexpensive way. So you can just create snapshots every hour, keep them as long as you need, delete, you know, delete them at the end of the day, um, and then have the ability to, um, you know, get the data from that after the fact. Um, and then clones allows you to like create um, kind of like virtual copies of those previous states. Um, so you know, this is not something that is necessarily applicable to every application, but it's, it's something that um, could be useful as you're designing a new application. Um, was there another question? There was some slide or two back that said expand. Yeah. What is that? Um, I hope it's what I think it is. It is, it <laughs> is, probably, it is probably not what you think it is. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> um, I think it was um, auto expand or something like that. So um, probably what you want is to the ability to add a device to a RAID Z group, um, which, yeah. it, uh, which I don't is need it as much now because I'm primarily running stuff in somebody's cloud. Yeah, but uh, where I'm where I'm not allowed <laughs> <laughs> where I'm not allowed to do any ZFS management. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's made in Brian. Yeah. So I think the the feature that you saw is related to. Um, Expanding devices. So yeah. if you have um, a device, say like a LUN that goes over, you know, a SAN, some other storage box, um, then if you can increase the size of that LUN, on, um, you know, on the storage box, and then ZFS will notice that you did that, and then expand the size of the storage pool to use yeah. that space. Yeah. Um, it was, it's got all the Mac OS port. <coughs> so the Mac yeah. OS port. Um, this is. So there have been several Mac OS ports. Um, the, the, the one which I'm mentioning here um, is unique in that it is actually being developed in the open, totally open source, um, unlike, say, the Apple one um, or the, the Zevo uh, one. So um, this is very, this macOS port is very young. It was uh, just started a few months ago, so um, we're really excited to see where it's going to go. Um, but there's definitely people that are using it, like, on their desktops. Um, I don't know if I would, like, you may want a backup, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that's very exciting. I think it, because it's being done in the open, it has a much better chance of long-term success than some of the other Mac OS ports that are super fast. Other questions? Cool. Thank you. All right, thanks guys. Great.
Um, all right, so our, um, we are, are, are close to done here, and uh, thanks for, for, for sticking with us. Um, I, and uh, we've got one more. Um, uh, uh, Max is going to talk for, for 10 minutes or so um, on, um, if, you, if you thought you were a crush depth now. Um, it's less than 10 minutes. It was 10 minutes. Oh, wow, all right. So um, Max Brunning uh, of Joy, there you go. Um, Max Brunning unplugged. <laughs> you don't need the projector to turn off. Okay, so um, I wasn't sure what I would talk about. I was asked to talk, and uh, so for a bit I thought, oh, I'll just do some D-Trace stuff. And Brian said, why don't you talk about ZDB? Anyone ever use ZDB in here? Mm. It's interesting, this whole side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> So ZDB is, uh, stands for uh, ZFS uh, dog bar, no, debugger. Um, and I thought, well, instead of going through some examples showing ZDB, which you can always get from taking a course that I teach, I would talk about why ZDB sucks as a debugger. And Matt, my apologies if you work with ZDB as that. So yeah. Did you write ZDB? Sorry. You did write ZDB. <laughs> okay, um, at any rate, uh, some problems with ZDB. Um, I could not. One problem with ZDB is uh, it's a file system builder, and let's say you can import a, your ZFS pool. Well, you basically can't run ZDB on it either. So if you can import the pool, then it isn't that buggy because you were able to import it. Okay, so this is one problem. Second problem with it, um, which to me is a, a slightly larger problem, is it's not interactive. So you type ZDB and you, you type a command to look at anything. And some of the commands uh, give you two lines of output, which isn't too useful. And then there's the ZDB minus DDDDDDDDD data set name, and you run that command and you go home, and maybe you go to Europe for the week or two weeks and you come back, and it's still scrolling on your screen. It's giving you so much output. So, what do I think is better? What I would like, and this I've done, but I did it about six years ago, and it needs some work, and maybe I'll put it on GitHub, and anyone who's interested can, can take a look at it. What I would like is, I would like to actually be able to do something like this. I don't know if people can see this. MDB, and then say, dev, disk, C0, T0, D0, or whatever, one of your CFS disks, and then do things like, well, and what I did was, when I did this initially, I added a, uh, a dmod, a d command, that allowed me to load CTF information from the kernel. Okay? And I'm, I'm talking directly to people who work on CFS, actually, because I still think this is the right way to do this. Because then what I could do is things like this. And dump out an Uber block. And I, I wrote a walker so I could walk the array of Uber, Uber blocks. And I added a block pointer command so I could take a physical address on the disk, colon, colon, block pointer, and it would dump out a block pointer. Or I could say, I could look at the Uber block and get the uh, there's a block pointer in Uber block, which basically gives me an offset, and I can say that address, colon, colon. Uh, here's where it got, gets a little tricky. A lot, of the, a lot of the metadata in CFS is compressed. So right now, I, what I'm thinking the right way to do this would be... Well, yes, all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some, of the, some of the zap stuff is not always compressed. But yeah, most of it is. So at any rate, so so you have some you have some physical address on the disk, and maybe what you want is something like a Z print, where you specify the compression, you make a default so you don't need the minus D, and then maybe this address is the address of a D node T. And it dumps out a la MDB, so it's interactive, it looks just like MDB. I think it's a good idea. But that's my talk. That's it. <laughs> so did five minutes. Six years ago? I did this about six years ago. Yeah. I did not do the Z print. What I did was 
I took ZDB and had it dump raw data out to a file, and then I would run, and then I would, I would decompress it with, ZD, with ZDB, and then I would run MDB on that file, so I would say zero colon colon print or whatever. It, it worked, but it was kind of unwieldy because they had to go back and forth between MDB and ZDB. So this is the only thing I didn't get around to because this I found to be a little bit more difficult. Than it, but the changes to MDB for load CTF were pretty pretty trivial. Is, is, the, I mean, is the primary use case for this? Is that the primary use case for this is for me to understand what the hell's going on on this, so I can explain that IT system. Uh, could it have other uses? Yeah, I, I actually was able to use yeah, it. Wait a second. It's, it's like lots of lots of you get a massive content on the top of that, and so that's the So, you have to sort of watch what they I would. I mean, it could be very interactive, interactive because you mail George Wilson. What? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 It's not yeah. 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 so interactive debugger, it's still for email. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I could I use it with UFS, yeah. and you could, I think somebody robbed my, Robert might have mentioned using it with PCFS. And so, it, the whole idea of just taking a raw disk and, and saying, okay, I know what the structure is and I've got the structure, why not use MDB with it? So it's a modular debugger and then it should be modular and send me some what it debugs, as well as the fact that you can add modules. Yeah, go after it. All right, okay. GitHub, coming coming GitHub near you. Soon, okay. soon. You can go into OpenCFS, but yeah. Matt will be able to add it as another bullet on his OpenCFS slide. All right, excellent, Max, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so I, uh, I know it's very late. Um, I think we've got some, uh, are there still drinks over there, Deirdre, if people want to? Yeah, and there's more beer in the far fridge in the kitchen. And, and, and there's a little bit of pizza left out in the kitchen, if anybody's still feeling Pizza left out, you're gonna ha you may have to fight me over it, or actually duel Dave and Cart. We did have someone who raised their hands, saying that they, that they quote, own in Cart. Um, and that is gonna, I mean, this is, is Clash of the Titans, so I guess it's gonna be happening here. I will be here until last part, or until we get kicked out of the building, but. Um, wouldn't mind some so, help putting chairs away. Yeah, and anyone help putting chairs away, that'd be great. Um, but thank you very much, and thank you, Deirdre, for uh, this. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much.